Hey folks, how you doing? Hopefully you're all having a great day today. The last project that I just made was an Osage orange bench for the outdoor patio area. Uh, if you've watched the video, just a very, very basic build. Um, just a bench with five feet, five legs. Third mortise and tenon joints, super simple. All those joints, somebody asked if they were, I, they were dog bone mortise and tenons. Did I do that for visuals or for added strength? Uh, I did that specifically for visuals. I think that's just more interesting than a simple slot shape that you would see on a mortise and through mortise and tenon joint created with a router. Um, so just looking at it, it would just catch your eye a little bit more. So it's just mainly the intent was visual interest. That being said, the more you think about it, it has a little bit more surface area, maybe a little bit more conflicting geometry. So maybe there's some added strength there. Uh, but I think you're kind of, it, it, in regards to strength, I mean, that's a two and three eighths of an inch thick top, solid hardwood legs all the way through that. The, do the dog bone itself was about three inches wide and I think about an inch and a quarter and its widest point. That's a really strong joint, epoxy together. I think at that point, you're kind of arguing whether it's better to take a, an 18 wheeler or a tank to go check the mailbox. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's, it, it wasn't done for strength, but I think it may, may have added just a little bit more. Um, so that project was a one-day build. I'll consider it a one-day build with a little bit of an asterisk because it took about seven hours of shop time. So, hey, one-day build. But I spread that over three days because Thursday when I started, I started late in the afternoon and only had enough time to flatten the top and the bottom. Friday when I worked on it, I did get a lot done, got all the legs done, all the joinery done, glued it together, and then I just had to wait for the glue to dry. So I, just, I couldn't continue with anything. I had to wait for the epoxy to dry. And it wasn't until Saturday morning, super early, I was out here at 4 a.m. Uh, flush trimming the top of the tenons with the table, with the bench top, and then sanding it all, and then um, doing a, applying the, the finish and actually getting it set out in place before the sun even came up. Uh, so there was some order of operations there where no matter what, you have to stop and let it sit overnight for the epoxy to cure. So one day build-ish, maybe. I'll call it a one day build still. Uh, there's a learning lesson from there. And, and normally when I make a mistake on a project, if there's something to learn, during the project, I'll put it in the video, but if there's nothing to learn during the project, if I just make something, you know, do something stupid, I won't put it in the video. Hindsight's always 2020 now. I know exactly what happened. I blamed it on the machine. So on the first, I had problems with both of the radius cuts that I did cutting the bench to length. The first radius cut that I did, um, I thought that when I Z-zeroed off of the machine bed with the automatic touch off, that I thought there was a glitch in Mach 4 because Beyond that particular situation, Mach 4 is an incredibly buggy program. The, the copy I have is, anyway, just very, very buggy. I've got all kinds of little buggy issues with it. So I just chalked it up as the Z-axis messed up because when I completed that cut, it was a full half of an inch into the spoil board of my CNC machine. I thought, what in the world? The Z-axis must have just been off by a half of an inch. So I re-zeroed after that cut and made the second cut. And then during the second cut, the bit actually came out of the spindle, scared the crap out of me. I was, I was, I was recording it handheld and I, I'm looking through the monitor. So I'm not looking physically at the wood. I'm looking through the monitor and I see sparks. I'm like, oh crap. So I didn't even look at the wood. I just ran over to the other side of the machine, smacked the e-stop button, and then I had to go through the rehoming process and all that. But I smacked the e-stop button, look back, the spindle's about a foot away from it and the bit's sitting in the wood. And I'm like, crap, I broke a bit. How did I break a half inch bit in, in this wood? That's crazy. Came up closer to it and like, no, I didn't break it. It just, it just slipped out of the collet. So I thought those were two separate incident, incidences. Incidences? I thought those were two separate uh, problems. And it wasn't until five minutes ago, literally five minutes ago, uh, that I actually stumbled upon what happened. So... The Z-axis wasn't messed up when I made the first cut. Even though it was into my spoil board, what happened was it slipped out of the spindle during the first cut and I didn't know it. So uh, this is the off cut from the first, first pass, or the, the, the first one. So this is the entrance side and you see this defined shoulder. So I remember when I was making the first cut, at this point I had not 
put a half inch bit through this dense of a wood. If you're not familiar with Osage Orange, it's incredibly dense. Uh, much harder than hickory. I don't know about much harder, but it's definitely harder than hickory. So I noticed during that cut, you can tell from the sound, that's going too aggressive. So I bumped the RP, not the RPM, I bumped the feed rate down after it completed the first cut. And I noticed after the first cut, it's like, oh, that was a lot of, that was a lot of material that was removing as it exited right here. So then I thought, maybe, maybe something's up. Let it continue cutting. And you can, as you can see, these are much cleaner cuts as it goes down because I'm not running as fast. The, the, way, the reason why you get this, um, this shoulder right here, this little lip, is you're being too aggressive with the cut and the bit is deflecting a little bit. So as it deflects out, or in this case, in, it creates a little bit of a shoulder. So uh, as I got through this, that's when I realized, oh, something's up. The Z-axis is completely messed up. It wasn't until, like I said, five minutes ago today that I analyzed this and I thought, aha, as I made the first pass, it, that right about here, it started to pull down out of the spindle. And probably somewhere right around here is when I slowed it down. And that stopped it from pulling out of the spindle. That makes sense. So at that point, it was already loose and ready to come out of the spindle for the second cut. The more you know. I've never had that happen to me before. I've broken many bits running too fast on the CNC machine. Uh, but I've never had one actually come out of the spindle. And I'm very thankful, I'm very thankful <laughs> that it was a half inch spiral upcut bit that just kind of just stuck into the wood and that was that. I'm very thankful that that was the case. And it wasn't that big two and a half inch diameter fly cutter that I've been using very regularly over the past couple weeks. I've also ordered a much longer wrench for the collet. One thing that I don't like about the new spindle on this particular, or the new spindle upgrade that I just did is the wrenches that come with it. I, I never use the wrenches that come with routers just because I, I don't like them. They're always too short. Uh, in my last setup, I never used the original wrenches. I bought my own longer wrenches. So you have a little bit more mechanical, mechanical advantage, advantage, but also you can use one of the long wrenches up against your body to stop it. So you can have both hands under the collet, one with a wrench and one holding the bit rather than having both on the actual small wrenches. So um, that was kind of a lesson learned. Um, I ordered a much longer wrench that I can't find anywhere locally. I think it's a 33 millimeter open-ended wrench that I had to get. I think that was interesting. Bit came out, scared the crap out of me, ended up just sliding out of the collet during the cut. Never had that happen. Uh, someone asked about the Osage Orange. Is it easy to cut? Uh, you know, with sharp tools, um, if sharp tools, and so long as your speeds and feeds are correct, uh, same with, you know, running it through a table saw blade or a router table or a bandsaw, as long as your stuff is sharp and you're not overly aggressive with your cuts, it'll do fine. Um, I didn't use any hand tools on this particular uh, species, so I can't speak for that, but it is a crazy, crazy dense wood. I've heard other people saying that it turns wonderfully. Uh, so, so there's that, um, doo -doo 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 -doo. and the, the finish that I used is a simple oil wax finish. So my philosophy on finishing completely changed after, uh, Mark Spagnolo released a video talking about wood finishes and, and how they held up over many years outside in his two environments, very drastic environments. Uh, I think one was in, you know, Phoenix in the desert in Arizona. And then uh, now he's in Colorado, so it's a different different set of elements, but one extreme to the other extreme, you know, cold and hot. So <clears throat> he basically came to the conclusion that no matter what you do for an outdoor finish, you're going to have to, to, to they all require maintenance. So you're going to have to refinish them because there's nothing that is just bulletproof outside. UV rays are just so aggressive. And then of course, moisture, the weather and all that stuff you have to contend with. So if you have to refinish something, why not make it as easy as possible to refinish? And after I saw that video, it just, just makes so much sense. And ever since then, I've just been being really easy with my finishes, going with oil wax combos and, and not really worrying about the outcome because you can always refinish it super easy. Uh, and not really worry about it. So uh, this is also kind of an experiment for me because I'm using an, an, a, an oil wax finish and I'm leaving it outside. And the chairs that I just made for that fire pit area, same oil wax finish, 
but I'm bringing them in because they're a little bit uh, a little bit smaller pieces. This is a two and three eighths of an inch thick slab of Osage orange with one and three quarters of an inch thick legs um, that are ash. So I'm kind of I'm gonna kind of just let it roll and let it get abused out in the weather and and see what it see what it does. Some people said that the ash will rot out definitely faster than the Osage orange because ash doesn't do well outside. I don't have any long term experience with either ash or Osage orange. Uh, but that being said, there's no direct ground contact with the ash to the ground. It's, it's, it's on a cement slab, and it's in an area that doesn't pool water. So it's going to get wet, um, and we'll see. I'll, I'll, be definitely, I'll definitely be sure to add uh, some, some, some images throughout its lifespan and keeping you guys updated and, and how it ages. Also, Osage Orange, when you cut it in the shop, it's like... It's like a pollen bomb went off. Same with Paduk, right? Paduk is is an or is a really really vibrant orange pollen bomb. This is yellow, but it all turns it all turns a beautiful brown after a while. So this is this is the surface cut off the sawmill from three years ago. Now this didn't really have much UV exposure. This was the slab that I had was always stored inside, whether it was in my shop, which was climate controlled, my last shop or there's a little bit of a time that I moved all that out to a storage shed and that wasn't climate controlled, but no UV exposure. And then in this shop, it's almost well, a little over two years. It's just been sitting, uh, sitting covered up. So this is the color that it will eventually turn to. And I think that once it turns this nice golden brown, dark chocolate brown, it'll look beautiful, even more beautiful in my opinion, with the lighter colored ash dog bones sticking through. So I'm looking forward to letting this actually age. But when you cut this, it is so yellow and so pollen-y, it'll look like a pollen bomb went off in your shop. That was, a, uh, that was an interesting experience with some interesting colored boogers. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's it for that particular project. It was, it was a lot of fun. Oh, I got that done. I don't know if I mentioned this yet. I got that done early Saturday uh, because I wanted to use it for a outdoor little cookout that we had. Uh, we made some, some chili over the fire with some friends and smoked some uh, baked potatoes. So hickory or cherry smoked baked potatoes. Oh, so good. I haven't had a baked potato in over a year. That was wonderful. <laughs> um, so that's it. The next project that I'm working on is a project that kind of defies wood movement. And I'll, and I'll talk about that in the actual video. So there is a tray that I have to remake. It's a basic tray, but I think that the interesting part is the actual wood movement aspect of it. So that's it for this video. I got to get started in on that. You guys take care. Have a great day. And I'll talk to you in the next video.